On the first day, God created light, but there was nothing there to see it. The first single-celled life spent maybe half a billion years ignoring photons, chilling, munching on methane and sulfur, the only Pringles flavor available at the time. It was when cyanobacteria evolved photosynthesis as their energy source that you could say Earth saw its first light-detecting organisms. The next evolutionary step for vision was phototaxis, a series of simple mechanisms for cells to move towards or away from light. Minor improvements occurred throughout the dawn of eukaryotes and multicellular organisms, yada, 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 yada. But it was the evolution of complex eyes which changed animal life forever. That's the story, right? The evolution of the eye from a basic bag of pigments to the complex organ you're using right now. It's a story more than sufficiently covered in thousands of articles, videos, and junior high biology textbooks, but it only covers the evolution of image forming, which is literally only half the picture. The evolution of color vision is largely disconnected from the evolution of the eye and gets very little attention. Hell, <laughs> the Wikipedia page for the evolution of color vision is shorter than the average online recipe for sugar cookies. But unlike the eye, the evolution of color vision cannot be so easily summarized in one diagram and is a little harder to make a pithy YouTube video on. But pith, I will bring. Did you know that color vision existed even before eyes existed? Uh, how does that work? And why do we have worse color vision than a lamprey? And why haven't we evolved away from color blindness? Today on Chromophobe, we'll be starting a four-part series on the evolution of color vision, with part one covering how our ancestors first developed color vision, the dawn of color. If I asked you how long ago the first animal with eyes lived, we could take a gander at the fossil record and get a pretty good idea because we know what eyes look like, even when they freaky looking. But if I asked you how long ago the first animal with color vision lived, what would you look for in the fossil record? Hell, even with living animals, determining whether they have color vision is stupid hard. The only conclusive method is behavioral testing, where we determine whether an animal has color vision by making it hungry and only rewarding it with food when it can solve simple color-based puzzles, like hundreds of them. We have performed these behavioral tests on everything from dogs to butterflies, but as you can imagine, there are some practical constraints when it comes to testing. For example, a great white shark or a T-Rex, because like, they're extinct for now. Keep absolutely still. This vision is based on color. Did dinosaurs have color vision? Actually, they almost definitely had tetrachromatic color vision, way more colorful than measly human trichromatic color vision. But we don't know this through fossils or behavioral testing. We know it through phylogenetics. Phylogenetics is the study of the evolutionary family tree, basically looking at how animals are all related to each other. As you can probably guess, with a name like phylogenetics, it didn't really exist 200 years ago. Back then, we were still categorizing animals based on their traits and their morphology, what they looked like. For example, this rock hyrax looked like a rodent, so it must be a rodent. After Darwin and the advent of widespread paleontology, we were now able to link living organisms through their extinct ancestors in the fossil record and start to hypothesize how they may have evolved. It was missing link fossils like this that made us realize that the rock hyrax's closest living relative is actually this guy. I mean, what can I say? Phylogenetics be crazy. Dear Rock Hyrax, not sweet that the bullies stopped picking on you when they found out who your brother was? Just make sure they don't find out who your sister is, or else you'll never hear the end of them manatee jokes. Sincerely, Protan. Fossils are only half of it though, because phylogenetics got a huge boost when we discovered genetics. Once we could look at the DNA directly, it got a lot easier to establish relationships between species and even track the evolution of a specific gene over millions of years. So that gave us two tools for understanding the grand evolution of color vision, analysis of the fossil record and comparison of genomes. Color vision is quite simply the ability to differentiate light of different wavelengths. The prerequisite for color vision is therefore to have different photoreceptors that are each tuned to different wavelengths. 
In humans, these photoreceptors are the L, M, and S cones. Each absorbs different bands of light because their light-catching proteins, the opsins, all differ slightly and are sensitive to different wavelengths. However, to qualify for color vision, only two different photoreceptors are needed, and this gives the sufficiently colorful dichromacy. We have sequenced the genome of and behaviorally tested enough animals that we're pretty confident that all animals that can detect color do so in more or less the same way as us. And so we have made two assumptions about color vision in animals. Number one, multiple different opsin proteins are required for color vision. And number two, having multiple opsins is sufficient for color vision. These would be very convenient assumptions because then all we would have to do is to count the number of different opsins in an organism's retina or even just in its genome and we could determine whether the organism had color vision. I go into these assumptions much more in a show note on my website, link in the description, and I'll be referencing a few more show notes later with this number. Otherwise, you can just take my word for it that the assumptions do hold, at least for vertebrates. So, once we know a vertebrate's cone complement, that is the set of opsins it has in its genome, it is a very good indicator of what kind of color vision they have. That means an organism with one opsin type seems to always have monochromatic vision, i.e. no color vision, and an organism with four opsin types seems to always have tetrachromatic vision, i.e. excellent color vision. Furthermore, if we see that two animals have very similar opsins, we can assume that their common ancestor also had those opsins. So, the story of evolution of color vision as we know it is actually just the story of the evolution of opsins. Opsins are a huge family of proteins that all follow this same general form. Absorb light, are ubiquitous in all forms of life, and are almost as old as life itself. There are two types of opsins. The first are present in single cell organisms from every kingdom except animals, mostly in bacteria and archaea, so are known as microbial opsins. Microbes have their own interesting color vision story that I will cover in part four of this series, but for now, let's continue with the second type of opsin, the animal opsins, which together enable vision in animals. Using some pretty basic phylogenetics, we see that animal opsins are present in every animal except sponges, which nails down their conception at just over 700 million years ago. Soon thereafter, the original type 2 opsin gene quickly underwent two duplications, which meant three similar opsin genes mutating independently from each other to be sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Considering our two assumptions from earlier, this could have made color vision possible in something not much more complex than a sponge. Unfortunately, these assumptions kind of get thrown out the window when we started looking at prevertebrates and would rely on our ability to behaviorally test modern versions of these ancestors, like this sea squirt. <laughs> I think I'd have an easier time testing the great white. So, 700 million years ago, while unlikely to have represented the dawn of color, is at least a loose older limit for color vision. These three opsin genes would later develop into three groups. First, the ciliary opsins, which primarily include the vertebrate visual opsins. Also, the rhabdomeric opsins, which primarily include the invertebrate visual opsins. And finally, the photoisomerase, which is like an anti-opsin that basically cleans up after the other two. Over the next 150 million years, the initial ciliary opsin would itself duplicate and evolve into several different opsin classes. By the time that the common relative of all vertebrates was around 550 million years ago, there already existed the four photopsin classes that give color vision to modern vertebrates. There is no theory for why these four opsins would have developed together if organisms didn't have the neural circuitry to support color vision. So for many, simply their presence is sufficient to assume color vision. Usually, such a bold claim requires a bit of supporting evidence from the fossil record. Luckily, only a few million years later, we'd get the most significant event in the history of fossils. The Cambrian Explosion, which happened 541 million years ago, was a huge acceleration of evolution and the first time animals emerged that you could show to a 10-year-old and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, that's an animal. Because before that, the most animal-like animal was just a tunicate which is just a rectum attached to a rock. Imagine this evolutionary leap as an arms race between shrimp and fish that likely started with the development of the first complex eyes, which are visible in this fossil of a Cambrian shrimp-like creature. 
But what kind of fossil evidence do we have that these opsins were actually being used for color at this point? A few years ago, a 300 million year old, surprisingly well-preserved fish was dug up in Kansas. Examination of its eye tissue revealed individual rod and cone cells in the fish's rocky eye sockets. These details are usually lost within days of death, much less hundreds of millions of years. So let's take a look. You see them? <laughs> Circling these rods and cones reminds me of Schiaparelli seeing canals on the textured surface of Mars that we now know not to exist, just like maybe those rods and cones don't exist. But regardless, these cones, according to the researchers, were sufficient proof that the fish had color vision. I found this all terribly dubious though, because if I remember anything from The Wizard of Oz, it's that Kansas, where this fish lived, is exceptionally black and white. Actually, there is some additional fossil evidence, not in color vision directly, but in the display of color. There are two ways a thing can be a color. The common way is through pigmentation, where certain molecules absorb some wavelengths of light and reflect others. Chlorophyll in leaves, melanin in your skin, any kind of paint, these are all pigments. The other way is through structural color, where the textured pattern of a surface acts similar to a prism to diffract the various wavelengths and therefore colors of white light. Butterfly wings, peacock feathers, and this iridescent beetle all display colors structurally. A simple example of such structural color is a diffraction grating, which is really just a set of parallel ridges with a very specific distance between them. It turns out such a pattern preserves exceptionally well in the fossil record, and we have found what are confidently assumed to be diffraction gratings in fossils from soon after the Cambrian explosion, about 515 million years ago. The question is, why would this animal have evolved structural color if there was nothing around to see that color? Now in pigments, the coloration is often a side effect, as in, as in chlorophyll. It's, it's gonna be green regardless of who's looking. However, there is not really another reason something would need a diffraction grating or any kind of structural color besides coloration. The existence of structural color must therefore also infer that there existed some animals that perceived that color, be it a predator, prey, or most likely a mate to the colorful animal. No matter how convinced you are of any of these individual claims, through either phylogenetics or the fossil record, if you were to ask when our human ancestors evolved color vision, it would be somewhere between this fish and this sponge. A common question whenever evolution is brought up is why? Why would evolution do this or, or do this or do this? We know the broad answer and that it gives them an advantage over the rest of their species, natural selection, yada, yada, yada. But when it comes to asking, what advantage does slowly impaling yourself with your own teeth give? The answer is not so clear. Neither is the question of why color vision evolved. It may seem obvious, but complexity for complexity's sake is not better, otherwise bacteria would have died out long ago. However, according to this one paper from the year 2000, color vision as we know it evolved because of ripples. We've been talking about some really old things in this video, but for the next topic, let's get really far back. Windows XP. Now, if you were a preteen like me when Windows XP came out in 2001, you were probably blown away by these sick photorealistic screensavers. If you were not born yet when Windows XP came out, maybe you need to Google screensaver. You may notice that shimmer over the surfaces. As light passes from air to water, all of the small waves and ripples on the water surface lead to random refractions of light that create this flickering pattern. A creature just chilling on the seabed hoping not to get eaten would therefore experience constant signals of changing luminosity that would be hard to distinguish from an approaching anomalocaris coming to chow down on your eyeballs. This so-called flicker theory postulates that having two opsins and two different photoreceptors essentially enables common mode noise rejection, such that the luminous noise from the ripples can be ignored, a steady color can be seen, and an approaching object can therefore be seen through the flicker. The theory is therefore that prey animals likely first evolved color vision to avoid predators so that they would tell the difference between a trig of the light and a trilobite. Let's end this video about 250 million years ago. The mammal lineage has just split off from dinosaurs and the very first mammals are enjoying the tetrachromatic beauty of the world. But soon, one ungrateful mammal would think, nah brah, color sucks, and proceed to get rid of it. 
why would mammals devolve their color vision? Well, that's a question for part two of this series, where we'll take a look at the nocturnal turtleneck, at the nocturnal bottleneck. And if you want to make sure you catch that, please subscribe to this channel. This is Chromophobe.